Well, hey there, guys. Greetings and salutations and welcome to Open Mic, the show here on the John Campia YouTube channel where the mic is open. The floor is yours. What do you want to talk about? What topics would you like us to discuss here? That is what we are here to do. Uh, my name, of course, is John Campia. Good to have you guys here with me this afternoon. And uh, if you're new around an open mic, it's 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 kind of like the John Campia show, I guess, just more informal, laid back. We're just talking, taking questions from you guys. Good to have you here on this post Super Bowl Monday, post Deadpool trailer release Monday. Of course, I heard they played a football game with the Deadpool trailer release yesterday. Um, and uh, yeah, good to have you guys here. Now, just to let you know, there are two different ways to get a question on the show. The first way is anytime, 24 hours a day, you guys can use the tip link, which you see right here, uh, streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tip and send it in there anytime, 24 seven. And then we'll get around to that ad on the next show. Also, if you are watching live right now, you can actually send in a question live uh, using the, the uh, super chats in the live chat and send it in there. And uh, we'll get to those questions provided they're appropriate to be used on the show uh, here on Open Mic. And it's good to have you guys here. All right. I start off with, with this, kind of the same diatribe gave yesterday. But, man, I, I mean, listen, all due respect to the Kansas City Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes is the most special football. I think him and Christian McCaffrey, because Christian McCaffrey is a living cheat code. That dude is just incredible. Um, but... Like Patrick Mahomes is just the only quarterback in the league that has the potential to maybe catch up to Tom Brady. It's unlikely, but he's the only one who's got the potential. So all due respect to Patrick Mahomes, but I have never seen a team luck out so badly getting to a Super Bowl because like the last two opponents literally just laid down and handed them the game. I honestly can't remember the last time a Super Bowl champion. I'm sure it's happened. I'm just saying I can't remember the last time it's happened that a Super Bowl champion only scored 17 points in their semifinal game and only scored 16 points in the Super Bowl in regulation until there was like nine seconds left in the game. Baltimore just choked and at San Francisco just handed them the game with that ridiculous third and four call with under two minutes left in the game to throw the ball instead of run it and run out the clock and win the game. But whatever, Whatever. They're now officially a dynasty. Kansas City Chiefs are a dynasty. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what anybody else tells you. The Kansas City Chiefs are now a dynasty. Uh, you win three out of four or three out of five years. You are a dynasty. It's official. Mm. Jurgen is saying uh, Shanahan is 0-3 in Super Bowls. Uh, no, he's only coached two of them. Uh, one of them was coached by uh, Jim Harbaugh. But um, even though, look, it, people can try to get on Shanahan, who is a great coach, even though he totally blew that third and four call, like totally blew that. He's going to be kicking himself all year for it. But here's the thing. He's done what 95% of the other coaches have not done. He's made it to the Super Bowl twice. He's made it to the Super Bowl twice. How many coach, not many coaches can say that. Andy Reid can say that. Uh, Bill Belichick can say that. Uh, there's a couple of coaches that can say that, but very, 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 very few can. And I remember back in the day when I was a kid, the Buffalo Bills, they lost all of them, but the Buffalo Bills went to four straight Super Bowls. And everybody's like, oh, Buffalo sucks. They lost four straight Super Bowls. They got to four straight Super Bowls, which most teams in the NFL would kill to say they say that. So, Whatever it is, what it is. But anyway, we're not here to talk about the Super Bowl. Although we can. It's my show. It's open mic. Talk about what I want. That's the nice thing about doing your own show. You can talk about whatever you want. I want to talk about my feet. No, I never do. Never want to talk about my feet. And I would never subject you to hearing me talk about my feet. Although my feet are precious things. Very, very precious things. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this Deadpool trailer that dropped yesterday. Um... <clears throat> You know, we, we talked a lot about it on the John Campus show earlier today. But there's, there's a kind of a bigger question like around, are people going to be excited about the, about the Deadpool movie? Obviously they are. I, I lost, I didn't count. I mean, last time I checked, 
it was like over 20 million views in the first 10 hours or something like that. Like some kind of crazy numbers. Um, people are clearly very excited about the movie now. That's fine. The, the bigger question though is, can the M can Deadpool three, can, sorry. And you're gonna have to forgive me. I know the movie is called Wolverine or Deadpool and Wolverine, but I've been calling it Deadpool three for over a year now. So you're gonna have to give me a bit to get used to. So I'm going to say Deadpool three a lot, but, um, can Deadpool three save the Marvel cinematic universe? Now I've already seen some people in the live chat here today, um, saying that, you know, the MCU doesn't need saving. You know, there's there's nothing about the MCU that needs saving right now. <clears throat> you know, it doesn't need saving, just just needs consistency. Well, I, I listen, and remember, I am no MCU hater. I'm an MCU fan, okay? I am. But when your last movie, The Marvels, doesn't even make 200 million. And your offerings as people's excitement level, I think this is fair to say. Is this not fair to say? What am I about to say, okay? Whether you love the MCU, hate the MCU, whatever. It, can we all agree that it's fair to say that as of the last couple of years, the MCU offerings have been weaker than we're accustomed to? Is that fair to say? Can we agree on that? Like you may agree or disagree about how bad the, how bad they have it right now or how bad they've gotten, but can we all agree? At, in principle, just say, yeah, we can acknowledge that in the last couple of years, the quality level and the results of the MCU movies the last couple of years have not been up to the same standard that they have been in the 10 plus years previous to that. We can agree on that, right? Okay. And when Bob Iger himself is coming out and saying, MCU has problems. We, we've got quality issues. We need to cut back. We need to reduce the quantity a bit. We need to pace these things a little bit better. We need to focus more on quality. When the CEO of the company is saying, we've got some quality issues with our Marvel Cinematic Universe, I think it's fair then for the rest of us to say that the MCU is, is suffering a bit here. <clears throat> and they need to be bailed out, right? They need to bail themselves out, but they need to ba be bailed out. Now, granted, just two movies ago, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 made over $800 million. That was a big hit, but Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quant Ant -Man and the Wasp Quantumania sucked, underperformed at the box office. The Marvels. I didn't think the Marvels was terrible, to be honest with you, but it wasn't great. It wasn't as good as Captain Marvel. It certainly wasn't as good as the Ms. Marvel TV show. It certainly wasn't as good as the WandaVision TV show. And it totally fell on its face at the box office, right? And as you go back, I mean, that's been the theme. And as the MCU has continued to put out that what by their standards is mediocrity, maybe it's excellence compared to the DCU, the old DCEU, but by Marvel standards, what they have put out recently including the the Disney Plus TV shows has been eh, has been okay at best some of it's been terrible like secret invasion some of it's been pretty good like loki season 2 <coughs> some of it's been dreadful like she hulk some of it was eh had had its moments but didn't really land stick the landing like moon knight they have not been succeeding by MCU standards maybe by other people's standards but not by MCU standards and, and, and as they have put out diminishing quality and getting diminishing results, the enthusiasm of the fan base has diminished, right? I mean, that's fair to say, isn't it? That you go back four years ago, go back four years ago, the mention of a new MCU movie, didn't matter what it was, boom, super hype, super excitement, right? Four or five years ago, didn't matter. New MCU project coming out, sign me up. I don't even need you to tell me the title. Sign me up. Everybody is flipping, flipping. Everybody's falling their faces over. Everybody loved it. The enthusiasm was super high. Today, I think it is fair to say that enthusiasm is not as high. As your quality has decreased, people's excitement for your product decreases. So when I say the MCU needs saving and can Deadpool 3 save the MCU, we're talking about 
can this Deadpool movie come out, reignite the excitement of the fan base that quite frankly has been lost for a while, but reignite that excitement and deliver box office results that we became accustomed to seeing the MCU turn in. <clears throat> Remember, the MCU was averaging a billion dollars a film for a while. Not every film made a billion, but when you added them all up for a good chunk of time, the MCU was averaging nearly a billion dollars per film. So when I bring up the question and ask, can Deadpool 3 save the MCU? That's what I'm asking. I'm asking, can it do those two things? Can it reignite the excitement of the fan base? Because it's not as hot as it used to be. And can it then deliver those box office results, getting people flooding out to the theaters that the MCU movies used to do? Because if Deadpool 3 can do that, and that's a big if, but if Deadpool 3 can do those two things, reignite the passion and excitement of the fan base, deliver the box office results by getting all the people to come out and see it multiple times and get excited about it. If Deadpool 3 can do that, then you're going to see the next eight, nine, 10 months, whatever it is till the next movie comes out, a renewed passion for the MCU, a renewed excitement for the MCU. If Deadpool 3 can deliver on those things. And that's the question. Now, I believe it's going to be good because I, you know, I got all the faith in the world and good Canadian kid, Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> The projects that Ryan Reynolds and Sean Levy have done together have thoroughly entertained me, particularly Free Guy. I loved that movie. And I was very pleasantly surprised by The Adam Project, even though it's a Netflix movie, which normally suck. But, and let's say Ryan has had a couple of Netflix movies that have sucked. Red, uh, Red Notice and uh, frickin' Six Underground. Those are terrible. But, <coughs> but the movie he did with Sean Levy, that Adam, uh, Project Adam, was, was really quite good. And so I've been very excited by that. I love that Sean Levy's working with me. I love that the original writers are all back. There's a lot of reason to be enthusiastic, but it can't just have the potential. Deadpool 3 has got to crush it. It's got to knock it out of the park. And so, um, and Equity Group is saying, no way Disney letting Re Reynolds go full tilt. They are. Ryan Reynolds already made public statements and the writer said, Disney has given us zero notes, they said. Disney gave them absolutely, I mean, Disney was free to give them a little pushback if they wanted to, but the writer said, they gave us zero notes. We wrote whatever we wanted and they gave us zero notes. And listen, when you put out your first trailer and within the first 10 seconds, they're making a pegging joke Ryan Reynolds is joking about pegging in the first 10 seconds. You don't have to worry about Disney letting Ryan Reynolds go full tilt. They're clearly going full tilt. They're hundred percent going full tilt. No doubt. <clears throat> but just because they're going full tilt doesn't mean it'll be good. Just because they made two good movies before doesn't automatically mean the third will be good. I believe it will be, but it doesn't mean it will be. Because I really believe, especially coming out of the stench of Secret Invasion, the stench of She-Hulk, the didn't live up to its potential Moon Knight, the, you know, the big step down with the Marvels, the horrendous experience that was Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. And by the way, it pains me to say that because I love Paul Rudd in the role. I love Peyton Reed as a director. I love the other two Ant-Man films, but Ant-Man 3 just wasn't it. <clears throat> Everybody's got a bad day at the office. That was Peyton Reed's bad day at the office. Everybody's ha everybody has them. But it's left the fan base in neutral. What was a red hot revving, finely tuned machine of audience excitement and fan enthusiasm has quite frankly been in need of an oil change if you'll allow me the car analogy has quite frankly been in need of an oil change for a while can deadpool deadpool and wolverine can it be that oil change can it be that reinvigoration can it be the happy little nipple twisties 
that gets everybody perked and excited again for not just Deadpool 3, but the MCU in general. I believe, if anybody cares, that the answer is yes. As If the movie is great and, and lives up to Deadpool 1 and Deadpool 2, if the movie is great and lives up to those movies, I believe it will do it. You know, I always say around here, winning cures everything, right? <laughs> it does. Winning cures everything. And if they could come out with a great Deadpool movie and then not have anything else come out for a bit. And then, you know, we got stuff like um, Agatha coming. I, I got a lot of hope for the Agatha show. I love that character. Uh, I love uh, Catherine Hahn in the role. I, I, I think there's a lot of potential there. If Daredevil can be really good. I mean, listen, what I'm saying is Marvel is not in a great place right now. But the pieces to the puzzle are there where it can get back to a great place again if they execute on these next few projects. And if they do, I think they'll be well on their way. I think they'll be well on their way. So, yeah, we'll see, man. We'll see. Uh, I'm excited. I think a lot of people got excited and stoked by the trailers <laughs> or by the trailer that dropped. And we'll see how it all comes together. All right, guys. With that down, let's get over and start taking the questions you guys have been sending in here, shall we? We're going to get things started off here with Sam Fisher, who writes, One of three. I'm glad Percy Jackson is getting season two, but I didn't love this season. I did. Uh, liked, but didn't love. That's fair. Particularly the end. I, I didn't love the way they did the betrayal in the show. Uh, in the book, it was a blitz attack, and the betrayer felt actively malicious, uh, like Percy being poisoned by a scorpion sting. Here, it's a fight because Percy figures it out. In the book, Percy doesn't figure it out, or he figures it out last second, uh, right before it happens. I also felt uh, it left out important and specific, uh, and important and specific, but also um, easy to add details. For instance, Percy's sword is named uh, uh, Riptide, and for some reason, Sally is with Gabe, is because he smells so bad to cover up Percy's smell from the monsters. It's not that Sally has questionable taste in men, things like that. Well, I mean, <clears throat> let me let me address that here for a second, Sam. I I think movie and TV show fans do themselves an extreme disservice when they compare the movies or the shows they're watching to the books they may be based on. Because here's the thing, what's in the book is irrelevant. Oh, I know, I know that. Me saying that just pissed off a lot of people. I know it did, but it's true. It's irrelevant. I didn't read the Percy Jackson books. So me personally, Sam, I don't give two shits about what's in the book. And guess what? The majority of the people who watch the show, not 99% of them, but the majority, the majority of people who watch the show never read the books. So to me and the majority of other people, what's in the books doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is, <clears throat> do they tell a great story on the screen? It's irrelevant what was in the book. Did they tell a great story that's on the screen? That at the end of the day is all that matters. It really is. By the way, you guys are going to see me popping halls now and again. Um, I, I still have my cough. I'm going to have it probably for another month or so. So once in a while to get through the shows, I got to have the halls in my mouth. I know it drives people crazy when they hear that I got a candy in my mouth, but tough shit. It's what I have to do to be able to get through the show. So I apologize for that. But um, like important details. It wasn't important. I watched the show. I never felt like it was lacking any details. Well, in the book, yeah, I don't care what's in the book unless what was in the book fundamentally makes the show they put on the screen a better show. But I thought they made a great translation. That's why they call it adaptation. You know, they call it adaptation. And um, it, and, and the show worked for me. <clears throat> and that is why I gave myself a rule. Because I see so many people do this. Well, it's not as good as the book. Well, did you know they, they did this? Remember, we talked about this thing in Forbes where they did this thing where people who read a book first and then watched a movie like the vast majority of them say the book was better. But 
when they did the opposite study of people who watched a movie before reading the source book, the vast majority say the movie was better. It all depends on what's your first experience. If your first experience is with one thing, the odds are you're going to say that thing was better, whether it was the book first or the movies first. So I really believe in judging a movie or a show by its own merits, by how good it is on its own, not by how well it adapted the book or got the, got the details from the book, because that's meaningless, absolutely meaningless um, to me at any rate. And so I gave myself that rule that I'm not going to read a book before I watch a movie because I want to be able to watch a movie fairly and view it and, and, and judge it on its own merits, not by what I thought they should have done, but by what they did. You know what I mean? So I respect that you're clearly a fan of the books. There are some details that you thought they could have worked into it. I respect that. I, I just, for me, I think that's a, that's folly because that's a game you never win. Right. I, I think that's a game you never win. Like, think about this. Not many people talk about it now, but when Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings came out, right? Not the Amazon show, the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings. A bunch of people today don't remember it or don't talk about it as much, but there was massive conversations at the time about how Peter Jackson blew it because there's no Tom Bombadil. And doesn't Peter Jackson know that in the books, this happens. Arwen was not there at that point of the story. That was so and so and so and so. Peter Jackson, did he even read the books? Right? And I just remember, guys, these are some of the greatest movies ever made, and you're crying and complaining because a character named Tom Bombadil was it. And I just remember, I'm never gonna do that. I am never going to do that. I'm gonna watch movies and TV show and evaluate them and judge them and enjoy them on their own merits. How good is this as a movie? Did it introduce me to great, to great characters? Did it tell a great story? Did they have things that thrilled me or excited me or kept me on the edge of my seat? Not about, did it follow this detail of the book? Oh, don't they know that Erwin wasn't at that thing? It doesn't matter. It does not matter. And so that's when I really started to believe that that movie fans who read books first are doing themselves a disservice. Or it's fine to read a book first, but then trying to compare the movie or show. The movie or the show is not the book. It's an adaptation, right? They're adaptations. That means they're going to kind of be their own thing in some ways. And you've got to let them do that. So that's kind of my feelings on it, Sam. But I appreciate you sharing your thoughts, man. I'm glad you at least enjoyed the show because I, I personally had a really good time with it too. Thanks for sharing your thoughts, man. All right. <clears throat> Next up, uh, we've got BK Dan who writes, John, totally agree with you on Gina Carano's suit against Disney. Yeah, it's just never even going to go to trial, that thing. Uh, she has a First Amendment of free speech, which was not hampered. Disney has a right of association, which they had exercised. Yeah, it's just as we talked about this a lot last week. No need for me to go into it a lot again. But the Gina Carano thing was very simple. Nobody inhibited her free speech. Your right to free speech means the government cannot stop you from speaking your mind. But other people are free to react to what you choose to say, however they please. That's their right of freedom, too. That's their right of free speech. And Disney as a business was like, we believe the stuff you're going around spouting off publicly on these public platforms and social media platforms is going to hurt our business by being associated with you. And we choose not to be associated with you because we think you're bad for business. That's their right. That's their freedom. Nobody's stopping Gina Carano from still being able to say whatever she wants to say. But if somebody chooses to associate with her or not associate with her as a result of what she's choosing to say, regardless of if you agree with what she says or not, that's Disney's prerogative if they want to. You know, um, Vince McMahon, whose name is kind of poisoned these days, but when the much for any of you who are wrestling fans, just a, a quick yes or no in the in the live chat there. Do any of you remember the Montreal screw job? For those of you who are wrestling fans, just fire a quick yes or no uh, into the live chat. If you guys remember the Montreal screw job. 
So a bunch of guys are saying, yeah, they remember the Montreal screw job. Andy, Michael, M. Joseph, Eric, Amir say, yeah, all you guys remember the Montreal screw job, right? Well, you know, Bret Hart is a good Canadian kid. So obviously I'm going to be biased for Bret Hart. But I remember Vince McMahon was being interviewed some years later, or some time later after the Montreal screw job. And somebody asked him, like, why did you screw Bret? <laughs> and Vince McMahon said something that actually has some truth to it. He said, I didn't screw Brett. Brett screwed Brett. It was a famous, famous quote, right? He said, I didn't screw Brett. Like a lot of you guys knew what I was going to say. A lot of you guys remember the quote. You guys also heard the quote, right? He said, um, I didn't screw Brett. Brett screwed Brett. Like, yeah, we weren't doing what Brett wanted to do, but it's our company. It's our business. We want to do this. You want to do something else. So we had to work around him. Now, I'm not saying I'm on the WWE side on that. Bret Hart's the best there is, best there was, best there ever will be, good Canadian kid. I, I'm very, very biased for him. But there's something to that. Disney didn't screw Gina Carano. Gina Carano screwed Gina Carano. That's the only person who screwed Gina Carano was Gina Carano. She screwed herself. Disney went to her, asked her to stop. She chose not to. It's like, okay, well, then we, we don't want to be associated with you. And that's their, um, that was their prerogative. So, and, and no judge is even going to hear this case that, that in a couple of months, Disney lawyers are going to go to the judge and they're going to submit what's called a, a motion to dismiss that basically says, your honor, this case has no merit. This shouldn't even go to trial. And a judge is going, I'm just telling you right now, a judge is going to automatically grant the motion to dismiss. That's just the way this is going to go down. All this is right now is Elon Musk, who I own two of his cars. I'm in some ways, I'm a very big fan of Elon Musk, but all this is, is Elon Musk and Gina Carano trying to make some noise. They know this isn't going to go to court. They know this is never going to go to trial. And they know they're never going to get what they're asking for. So it's just trying to get people riled up. That's that's all it is. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up, uh, we've got also from BK Dan writes, John, here's an LOL, what are the odds question. If there were a Fast and Furious slash Jurassic crossover, over under 35%, Dom wrestles the T-Rex to the ground after KOing three Velociraptors. Oh, it's 100%. If... If he is the producer of the movie, if Vin Diesel's the producer of that movie, 100% Dom single-handedly takes on T-Rexes and Velociraptors and takes them all down. Even in the, the Fast and Furious movies that I loved, four, five, six, seven, and eight, my one big criticism of the Fast and the Furious movies even in that era when I was loving all of them <clears throat> was the fact that Vin Diesel made this Dominic Toretto character literally a superhero. Like he went from a garage grease monkey fixing and racing cars to literally being the world's most elite combat artist, strongest human being in the world. Remember in Fast 9 when he literally pulled the the concrete roof down with his bare hands, just using the chains and pulled the whole thing down. Any super spy out there, doesn't matter. Dominic Trout can take him because he's dumb. He was literally the ultimate Mary Sue. And I say this as somebody who loved those movies until nine and 10, but from four, five, I didn't, I'm not a big fan of one, two and three, but four, five, six, seven, eight, love those films. But even though I love those films, Dominic Toretto is the Mary Sue of the film industry. 100%. And so, if the Fast and Furious ever crossed over with Jurassic World, 100% that Dominic Toretto would face a Velociraptor and literally take it down with his own two hands. That is the way Vin Diesel would have it written out. Uh, and I, I say that as a big fan of Vin Diesel. I love Vin Diesel. But yeah, that's the way, uh, that's the way we go. All right, next up. Um, an anonymous viewer writes, regarding console exclusivity, 
You simply cannot make every game for every console. Well, you can for the premium consoles. Anyway, the Nintendo Switch, I was about to say, you can't count Nintendo. It's in a different category altogether. Anyway, the Nintendo Switch is equivalent to a PS3 and controllers aren't for Call of Duty. A PS5 is built with VR capabilities, etc. Consoles are simply built too differently. Yes and no. The Nintendo situation is, is yes. Like there are clearly in one category, you have the Xboxes and the PS5s, right? That's one category. Nintendo is in a very different category. It's way more underpowered. Its games are, are, are meant to uh, appeal to a different sort of demographic. I mean, the, I, I, Nintendo Switch games are great. Don't get me wrong. Um, I, I was just playing Nintendo. I was playing the new um, uh, remastered uh, Mario RPG the other day. I love the Nintendo Switch, but those are two different categories of, of consoles. When I'm talking about platform exclusivity and whatever, I'm mainly talking about the highest platform of games, Xbox, PlayStation. There's really no reason um, that <clears throat> a game that comes out on one shouldn't be able to come out on the other. I understand there are business reasons for why they don't. I, I do. I understand the business reasons, but I'm saying philosophically, um, I think, I mean, there's no real one. One, you cannot make a game that will run on one that's the other one doesn't have the power to run. Right? So uh, that's just how I kind of personally feel. But again, from a business point of, point of view, I understand. I understand why they do it. I'm just saying philosophically, I don't like it. That's all. All right. Uh, Chip Crisper writes, hey, John. What are the chances that this is Deadpool and Wolverine's final ride? Zero. Uh, wasn't Ryan Reynolds saying last year that this was his last Deadpool film? Some people reported that. I don't think he actually said that. Uh, what if Deadpool and Wolvie die at the end and either take Fox with them or sacrifice themselves to save them, bring on the filthy? Here's the reason. Now, listen. <clears throat> Ryan Reynolds has not told me that there's going to be more Deadpool films. Okay? Let me be clear. I got no insider information telling me this otherwise. But why would Marvel bother making this movie if they don't have plans for it moving forward? Like, <clears throat> why would Marvel go through all the energy and all the effort with their big Marvel Cinematic Universe project without there being a plan to have multiple films? I completely believe that it would have been a situation of, okay, we'll let you guys do a Deadpool movie, but we want a commitment. We want, we don't just want a, a, a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, one shot and we're out kind of the situation. If we're going to invest a lot of time, energy, money, marketing, and all this kind of stuff into building up this big Deadpool thing, bring, I, I do think it's Hugh Jackman's last go because Hugh Jackman is just coming out for one more thing that I think he's done. But what, what would be the motivation of Marvel to do that unless it was for a longer term investment? Right. So I believe what happened <laughs> is they they simply told Ryan, yeah, we'll we'll do this Deadpool movie. We'll let you do whatever you want. You can go for the R rating and everything, but we want a commitment. Whether that commitment is three films, I'm sure it's not like a seven film commitment, but whether it's like three films or four films, I hundred percent believe it came with a commitment. I'm not sure that Hugh Jackman sticks around again because I, I think this was a one shot for him. Remember, he had retired as Logan years ago. The man's in his mid 50s. I mean, he doesn't want to have to try to maintain that physical shape anymore. Um, and I don't blame him. But <clears throat> I, I think this will be Wolverine's last movie. But I, I think we're going to see Deadpool at least a couple more times. We'll find out, though. I, I might be wrong, but uh, but we'll see. All right. <clears throat> Next up. Just Jay Newby writes. The other day, you guys were talking about Mads Mikkelsen about playing Doctor Doom, but said it would be tough since he's already shown up in the MCU in Doctor Strange. But so has Mahershala Ali, Cottonmouth, and Luke Cage. I think Mads is perfect casting for Doctor Doom. Yeah, but there's, you're missing, you're leaving something out there, Just Jay. <clears throat> when they announced the Blade movie and they cast Mahershala Ali, remember, Cottonmouth and Luke Cage were not a part of the MCU. They were do, they announced they were doing a Daredevil show, but but it was going to be a new Daredevil. Even though Charlie Cox was coming back, and even though Vincent D'Onofrio was coming back, this is now official. This is no longer speculation. This, they've made this official. The plan was for these to be a new Daredevil, 
not the Netflix Daredevil. So when they cast Mahershala Ali as Blade, it didn't matter that he had been caught in mouth because that was in the Netflix universe, not the MCU. Now, things have changed. A, a short time ago, they scrapped filming on Daredevil Born Again, threw out 90% of what they filmed and decided to start over again. Only now it is the Daredevil from the Netflix series. So... <clears throat> But at that point, it's too late, right? Mahershala Ali is already Blade. They've already announced that it's done. But I guarantee you, if they had originally planned, I guarantee this, if they had originally planned that Daredevil was going to be the Netflix Daredevil, they never would have cast Mahershala Ali. So, yeah, Mahershala Ali is doing it, but there were very extenuating circumstances. So when they cast him, he hadn't been in the MCU before because Luke Cage was not in the MCU. It was in the Netflix universe and they were never going to bring it over until recently they changed their mind. So yeah, listen, I'm 100%. Wait a second. Jake is saying you're wrong, John. I'm not, I'm not wrong. This isn't my opinion. This is fact. They've, they've, they've announced this. I'm not, I'm, I'm just telling you a fact. Like I'm telling you, this is an iPhone. That's not my opinion. That's a, that's a fact. Uh, it, it's it's 100 fact so anyway um whether <clears throat> um I, I look i think um that mads mickelson would be a brilliant brilliant i can't think of anybody off the top of my head who I think could really, that would get more people more excited about Dr. Doom than Mads Mikkelsen playing Dr. Doom. It's a little typecasting, I agree, but it would still be incredible, right? Um, it would still be incredible. I, I would love to see it, but they won't do it because he's already been in the MCU proper. And as himself, right? It's not like the Gemma Chan situation. When she was in Captain Marvel, she had all alien makeup on, right? She looked totally different. So you can get away with then having her in the Eternals. And so I would love Mad Mads Mikkelsen. Love him as Doctor Doom. But they're not going to do it. I mean, I hope I'm wrong. I, I will celebrate with you if tomorrow Kevin Feige's Mads Mikkelsen is our Doctor Doom. I will 100% party in the streets with you. I will be there. We will raise our glasses, toast it up, and be extremely excited about it. I, I will party with you over that. I just don't think I'm going to get that chance to party because I don't think they're going to do it. But I hope I'm wrong, man. I hope you're right, and I hope I'm wrong. All right. <clears throat> Next up, uh, we go to Tack, who writes, Sonic Film 3 is an adaptation of the game Sonic Adventure 2. It, alongside Last of Us and Chrono Tiger, is one of my favorite game stories ever. The game delves into the tragedy that put Eggman on the path of villainy, which I bet Carrie found interesting. <clears throat> I'm not... Is that totally true, though? Because what we do know is that when they greenlit Sonic 3 and they started planning Sonic 3... I don't think Jim Carrey had committed to being in it yet. I, I don't think he committed until they were already kind of well on their way. So I don't, I don't know. And I'm saying, I don't know, right? I'm not saying I know yes or no. I'm saying, I don't know. I don't know how huge of a role Carrey will play in this because his agreement to come into the project can, comes rather late. So I don't know. I do know this. I thought Jim Carrey killed it in the sonic movies i love him in the sonic movies i think he's awesome so uh the bigger the role for him in this movie for me the better man so i'm with you on that all right <clears throat> next up um jim none other writes or jm none other writes moana 2 i remember during the 2020 disney presentation they said they were doing a moana disney plus show for 2023 I'm now convinced Iger turned that into Moana 2. Now, fingers crossed, Iger turns their live action Lilo and Stitch Disney Plus movie theatrically. Okay, so here's the thing. You're saying I'm now convinced Iger turned that into Moana 2. They literally made that as a part of the announcement. <laughs> like they, When they announced that <clears throat> Moana was now going to be a movie at the end of 2024, 
a part of the announcement was literally uh, Bob Iger saying, yeah, it was going to be a TV show, but I saw it. I saw how good it was. I wanted to make it a movie. So you don't have to guess or be convinced that that's what happened. They actually made that a part of their announcement. So it's 100%. That's what they're doing. With Lilo and Stitch, I don't see I don't see it. Because <clears throat> here's, the, here's the thing. The Lilo and Stitch situation is nowhere near the popularity of Moana. Now, you can disagree with that, but, but here's the thing. Moana is a seven-year-old movie. And the numbers just came out. And shit, I dropped my I dropped my hauls. So now I gotta grab another one. Um <clears throat> the numbers just came out. The number one streaming movie of 2023 was not Avatar the Way of Water. It was not anything else. The number one streaming movie of 2023 was the seven-year-old Moana. The number one streamed movie of the year across all platforms. No movie. Streaming original, theatrical original, no movie was streamed more than Moana. A seven-year-old movie. <clears throat> Lilo and Stitch was not on that list. Lilo and Stitch was not on that list. I, and so I don't think they're equivalent. I, I don't know that there would be as much excitement for the Lilo and Stitch thing. So, But I, I could be completely wrong about that. I, I know a couple of my friends just adored Lilo and Stitch. I thought Lilo and Stitch was really, really cute. Uh, but, you know, we'll see what happens. <clears throat> All right. Next up. Marley Marr writes... If Disney, Alan Horn, never fired James Gunn and he had become the head of the MCU cosmic side, how different do you think would the state of the MCU be today? Not very different because everything really changed when Bob Chapek became CEO and stripped uh, stripped Kevin Feige of his authority. I mean, that's where the tide turned. And whether James Gunn was Kevin Feige's right-hand man or not, it wouldn't have mattered. Bob Chapek came in and one of the very first things he did was he stripped Kevin Feige of a lot of his authority and of a lot of his decision-making power. And he created a new middle layer of management headed by a banker. That's his, that was a loyal servant of his to make all the decisions about what stuff gets made and where it goes. And had, um, had, James Gunn been Kevin Feige's right-hand man for the cosmic stuff. It wouldn't have changed any of that. So I'm not sure it would have been any different. Listen, and I love Alan Horn. I'm a huge Alan Horn fan, but I think that was the one big mistake he ever made was he fired James Gunn way too quickly. I think if they had taken more time, really calmly thought it through, I don't think they ever would have and never should have fired him in the first place. But I think that's the one mistake Alan Horn made. And I think he regretted that. All right. Well, obviously he did because later he changed his mind and brought James Gunn back. All right. <clears throat> Next up, Anonymous writes, one of two. The Flash underperformed because of the free screenings, in my opinion. You're dead wrong about that, and I'll mathematically explain to you why you're wrong about that. Uh, the Flash underperformed because of the free screenings, in my opinion. After a certain point, WB was just giving money away. Uh, one week's worth of free screenings is more than enough to generate buzz, but three to four weeks is crazy. We all saw the film for free. No, we didn't. Uh, I'm always on the lookout for free screenings. I've never seen it go for that long before. I can't help but be a conspiracy theorist. I personally didn't like Andy Muschietti's aesthetic, but The Flash was easily a $400 million plus film. Okay, so here's the thing, Brian. Um, I'm, and I say this to somebody, I did not like The Flash. I loved it. I didn't think it was one of the greatest comic book movies ever made like some people were making it out to be, but I loved it. I thought The Flash was great. I don't give a fuck what anybody else says. I thought it was great. I had a wonderful time watching it. Despite all the problems that Ezra Miller is, um, I thought the movie was great. It, it was wonderful. But when you do the math and you add up exactly how many, you know, you know what this is like earlier today on the John Campus show, here's what happened. Earlier today on the John Campus show, somebody wrote in and said, I think Deadpool 3 is opening on the same weekend as San Diego Comic-Con. How much do you think that's going to hurt the box office? And I said, it's not going to hurt it at all. Zero. Because 
they're anticipating, I think this year, about a hundred thousand people are going to go to Comic-Con, right? About a hundred thousand people are going to go to Comic-Con. Even if every single one of those 100,000 people going to Comic-Con this year would have gone to see Deadpool 3, at a national average ticket price, when you take main times and matinee times and all that kind of stuff, the average ticket price in, in America is about $10.15, something like that. Even if all 100,000 of the people going to Comic-Con went to see Deadpool 3, that only equals $1 million of box office. One million dollars of box office. Opening Deadpool 3 on Comic Con weekend is going to have zero impact. You're talking, Brian, like every movie theater had five free showings of The Flash every day for three or four weeks. That's not it. That's not remotely true. It was a very, very tiny, tiny, tiny number of the amount of people who were actually able to go to a free screening. I remember Deadline gave out the number they, you know, they anticipate in the buildup to the flash that X number of people were able to see it in free screenings, but it was a really tiny number compared to the numbers of people that go to a movie. Maybe a number that would have equaled $2 million in box office, maybe $3 million in box office, but no, Brian, the free, the free advanced screenings, um, did not have anything to do with the box office failures of The Flash. Had nothing to do with it. At most, it would have made a difference of one, two, or maybe $3 million. But here's the thing. Like a lot of the people who went to the advanced screenings had a good time with it, and they did go back and watch it again, and maybe even brought some other people to go see it because they liked the film. So any difference would have been completely negated. Right? Like completely negated. Um, so yeah, man, I, I thought the movie was great. I had a good time with it, but you can't blame its financial failures on the fact that they have free screenings because the numbers don't equate. The numbers just don't equate there, unfortunately. And believe me, Brian, I would love to find excuses for why the flash, because I thought the flash was great. I, I, I thought it was great. I would love to find excuses for why it didn't do financially, but that is simply not the case. That's not the case here, unfortunately. All right. Thanks for sharing your thoughts though, man. I appreciate it. Uh, anonymous writes. The only reason we're getting Top Gun 3 now is because MI700 performed in the worldwide box office. Zero truth to that. 100% zero truth to that. If, if MI7 was a $2 billion film, we would still be getting a Top Gun 3. Make no mistake about it. Um, I doubt MI8 actually happens. It's going to happen. Tom Cruise is already uh, putting money behind it and all that kind of stuff. Would you rather have MI8 or Top Gun 3? I would rather have Mission Impossible 8. There's nothing left to do with Top Gun. There's, I mean, like in Top Gun 2, in Top Gun Maverick, they couldn't even tell you the name of the bad guy. Who is it they're attacking? We don't know. Why are we attacking them? Not really sure. They have weapons, but are they an enemy country? <laughs> if they are an enemy country, which one? Not really sure. Like they didn't even, they couldn't even name the country. I mean, really, what else is there to do? Now, don't get me wrong. I love Top Gun Maverick, and I'm very excited to watch Top Gun 3. But to me, the Mission Impossible franchises are... Um, Mission Impossible is the better franchise. You got deeper story, much more developed characters, uh, a lot more you can do with it. I mean, because if Top Gun, you got only one thing you can do. Maverick's got to get in the cockpit and go fight in fighter planes. That's all you've got. And I love it. And I can't wait for part three. Mission Impossible, there's way more things you can do. So here's the thing. Top Gun 3 was going to happen regardless of what MI7 did at the box office. And MI8 is definitely going to happen. It's definitely going to happen. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, so there you go. All right. Uh, next up. And then we're going to take a short break, I think. Uh, this one comes from Brian O'Connor who writes, Honestly, I don't understand why Marvel is going back to Daredevil. What is the point? There are so many other characters and stories that Marvel could be working on. <coughs> uh, their time and energy should be spent elsewhere, in my opinion. Daredevil was perfect as it is for me. I think, Brian, you just answered your own question. Why go back to Daredevil? 
And then you said at the end, Daredevil was perfect for you. You just answer your own question. Why go back? Because people loved it. That's why you go back. Especially now when Marvel is in such a situation that they need wins very badly. We just talked at the beginning of this show about the significance of Deadpool 3 and how important it is for it to knock it out of the park. They need the win. They got to get the fan base re-energized. They got to do a lot of that kind of stuff, right? With Daredevil, um, you have a, a, a property that the fans have been screaming for to bring back the Netflix Daredevil. It's one that's already beloved. You have a built-in way to really re-energize a fan base. And listen, all you got to do is look at the social media um, interactions. Daredevil, Born Again, is extremely talked about online. And it's the kind of thing that they need. Now, look, though, if we're going to say, <clears throat> well, we already had Daredevil on the Netflix show, so Marvel shouldn't have to do it now. Okay, but if you say that, then you also got to say, you know what? We had Hugh Jackman's Wolverine in like 12 movies. We had Professor X in like whatever number of movies. You know what? We had two Deadpool movies over at Fox. Why does Marvel have to do Deadpool, right? Because <clears throat> I'm just saying, if you're going to say, well, we already had Deadpool in another universe, What's the point of bringing him over into this one when there's other characters to do? Well, then you got to say the same thing about Deadpool. You got to say the same thing about Wolverine. You got to say the same thing about X-Men. You got to say the same thing about Fantastic Four. We've already done Fantastic Four. Why bring them over? Right? You can't just say, well, we've done Daredevil. They're bringing him back because it's something that excites the fan base. And, and, and I think we can agree, Brian that that is something Marvel really needs right now. They need to re-energize the fan base. They got to get the fan base excited again. I think it's very, very important that they do that. Um, all right, guys, listen, <clears throat> we still got a lot more questions to get through, but before we go on, we're going to take a quick second here and thank one of the sponsors of today's episode of Open Mic, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours. Speaking of Ryan Reynolds, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. On average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for 15 bucks a month. I've told you guys many times that after switching to Mint Mobile, I am spending less than a third on my cell bill than I used to with a major carrier. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All Mint plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And don't worry about having to change phones or numbers. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. So guys, to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash Campia. That's mintmobile.com slash Campia. Cut your wireless bills to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Campia. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile for sponsoring today's episode. All right, guys, with that down, let's keep things on going here with your questions, shall we? We're going to pick things up here with Twilight Boy, who writes, Deadpool and friend, if you know, you know, cameo idea deadpool goes up to ben affleck and asks him to suit up as daredevil but he politely declines as for other cameo predictions uh mobius taylor swifter <laughs> professor x magneto quicksilver boner uh miss minutes um listen the ben affleck thing is not a big stretch remember jennifer garner is already confirmed it's confirmed jennifer garner is going to appear as electra in this now, Jennifer Garner and Ben Affleck may no longer be married, but they still are very, very close. They co-parent. They speak very highly of each other. Uh, they have kids together, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> I could totally see Ben Affleck doing this. Now, I'm not saying I'd put my money on Ben Affleck popping up in this movie, but I wouldn't bet against it either. Um, uh, uh, Ian McKellen coming back maybe as Magneto. That's a possibility because Patrick Stewart has already kind of hinted 
that he'll be back and that he's also hinted that Ian McKellen may be back too. Quicksilver, maybe. So Professor X, definitely. Taylor Swift, I think is a good 70% chance there. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Next up, Garden Variety Vagabond writes, Sounds like the Coyote versus Acme movie needed either Ryan Reynolds or Paul Bettany's Chaucer in A Knight's Tale to be their pitch man to get audiences energized to see it. Yeah, I mean, this whole thing with the uh, Coyote versus Acme thing, it's amazing how much people pretend to care after something already happens. Because the reality is, before they announced that they were scrapping the Coyote versus Acme movie, nobody cared about it. Nobody cared about it. All right, I talked on my show this morning about the fact that after the original announcement of them doing this movie, which was ages ago, I have literally not had a single person write into me to ask a topic or a question about Coyote. I've had them ask about every other movie you can imagine, but not about that movie. Nobody cared about it. And Warner Brothers knew that and knew that if they put the money into marketing it and put it out in theaters and all that kind of stuff, it was going to cost them more money than it would make. And they decided to pull the plug on the project. That sucks for the people working on the project, but they all got paid. Everybody got paid. The actors got paid. The writers got paid. The director got paid. Everybody got paid. Which is why it cost Warner Brothers 70 to $75 million. But it's Warner Brothers movie. It belongs to them. They can do whatever they want with it. Disney can do whatever they want with any movie that belongs to them. Unless you have an, a contractual agreement to the contrary, like in the uh, um, Scarlett Johansson situation. In which Disney acted like dicks. Anyway. Um, but yeah, absolutely. They needed to get people to care about the movie and they just never did. So, yeah, it, it sucks, but it is what it is. It's part of the reality. As, as Robert Meyer Burnett often says, folks, it ain't show friends, it's show business. All right. Champion Chicken Nuggets writes, how about those Chiefs back-to-back, -back, baby? Hey, listen, back-to-back -back indeed. They are a dynasty. They got handed the Super Bowl on a silver platter, but they are a dynasty nonetheless. And Patrick Mahomes is uh, rapidly starting to make a name for himself as maybe one of the greatest of all time. He's not there yet, but whoo, he's well on his way, my friends. He is well on his way. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up. Um, Steve, Legends of Tomorrow, or Save Legends of Tomorrow, writes, um, what are your thoughts on Tubi making a streaming film for Wy Wyona Earp to finish that to finish that show's story? And do you think the streamer will do the same for other act shows with passionate fan campaigns like my namesake? Uh, I, honestly, I don't know. I've never, I've never turned on to be ever. Actually, good question for you guys right now. Have any of you, and, and I, I don't know what the answer to this is going to be. Have any of you guys watched Tubi? I don't mean like turned it on once, but I mean, do any of you guys in the live chat watch Tubi? Uh, no, nope, no. Bruce Lum is saying yes. Uh, S. McCauley is saying they adore Tubi. No, yes, no, 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 no. CC is saying Tubi still exists. Um, yeah. Um, listen, I know this. I never watched a single episode of Wyona or to be honest with you. So I don't, I, I have no skin in that game. Um, as far as Legends of Tomorrow, that would require a little bit of a budget. And I don't think Tubi's going to put much money into it. So honestly, I think the answer is it's irrelevant. I think the answer is it's irrelevant. Uh, but I, I could be wrong about that because I've never turned on Tubi. Uh, so I have no idea, but, uh, who knows? Maybe the John Campy show will go on to Tubi someday. One never knows. All right. Next up. Um, McDavid deserves better. That writes, are you aware of Steve Dangle, a Leafs YouTuber and current face of NHL punditry? I'll be honest with you. I've never heard of him, which is perfectly fine. I'm sure he's never heard of me either. Uh, while known for existential screaming and purple faced rants, he's very insightful and oddly calm after Riley's suspension for nearly decapitating sen uh, a senator. Uh, by the way, that's an Ottawa senator, not a legitimate, not a literal senator. Uh, bring on the filthy Go Oilers. Uh, yeah, I've, I've never heard of him. I'll be honest with you. 
I watch a lot of sports content, but it's all ESPN and Fox Sports sports content. Like it's Pat McAfee, it's Mike Greeny, it's Pardon the Interruption, um, it's uh, Colin Cowherd. It's like that's I, I consume a lot of sports stuff, Sports Center. I I don't not that I have any problem with sports YouTubers, but I don't follow or watch any sports YouTubers. Even though technically Pat McAfee is a sports YouTuber, so Pat McAfee would be the one exception to that. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, I so I've never even heard of Steve Dangle, uh, and again that, that that's no offense to anybody. I'm sure he's never heard of me, um, but I, I don't follow any. Uh, like sports YouTubers that way. So that's I'm, all of my YouTube viewing when it's sports, it's like Fox sports, it's ESPN, it's stuff like that. And other than that, it's usually tech, uh, like tech things like Linus, MKBHD, uh, Leo Laporte, uh, unbox therapy. Um, just, just a lot of tech stuff that I watch. And for some reason, a lot of videos on camper vans, whatever, I love, I want to, can I tell you something? I dream of having a camper van. I really do. And this is going off the, I'm going to show you something. Something I've been all oh, looking at and drooling over. Let me see if I can pull it up here. What's it called again? The Thor Tellaro 20L. <clears throat> I don't know why, but I have been absolutely drooling over getting this van let me see if i can bring it up for you here um i think this is it yeah oh i want this van mm, i want this van so bad my wife is like laughing at me all the time because i'm constantly watching videos on this stupid van like constantly watching videos on this van let me see if i can get this up here too it's and on the inside oh my god it's a it's a beauty Oh, it's a beauty. Bathroom at the back with a full shower, twin beds, good size fridge, microwave, air conditioning, heat, tons of power. Oh. Oh. You know, and I, I love the idea. Here's why I want one of these vans. I want one of these vans because, and you could, it's like six foot three inside, so you can stand up in it no problem. Like I said, full shower, toilet, like the whole bit. It's just gorgeous. Great TV, great internet connection. I want one of these things for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> one, I want to be able to go on a road trip and like literally just park in a Walmart lot and sleep, stay the night, shower, eat, have my own stove and all that kind of stuff. Just get on the road and drive. I love the idea of driving to the office and then in between shows, just go down into the parking lot and just go into my van. Just go hang out in my van, make myself some lunch, kick back, relax. I want to be able to drive to Canada in something like this. Here's the problem, though. <clears throat> Here's the problem. Anybody in the live chat want to take a guess how much this thing costs? Oh, yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, Webbs is saying, watch out, John. Ray's going to move into that van. Yeah, he probably would. But it's around, <coughs> Canadian Springs got it right, it's around $100,000. Ann and I actually went to go look at one the other day, just because she knows I've been watching these videos for like two or three months. She goes, fine, come on, we'll go to the dealership and go look at one. Oh, oh. So I went and looked at it, and Ann and I went, and then we fell in love with it. But it's... But it, the price tag on it was $114,000. <coughs> and uh, yeah, $114,000. But I mean, it's the cool thing is too with this thing, listen, this is me trying to talk myself into it. Like with this, by the way, there's also a tape. It's not put in, see in the, in the, on the floor there, there's a couple of like those round silver circles. It's got a Laguna table you can put in with a swinging arm. You can have a full work desk. I thought I could literally travel city to city 
And with the internet connect built in, I could like do live streaming from the road. I could go visit other cities and big movie theaters in other cities and do meet and greets and still do my show for the road. Like I'm doing all this kind of stuff to try to talk myself, to try to justify and talk myself into buying this thing. But um, <clears throat> that's a lot of money, guys. That is a lot of money. Um, <clears throat> that I just can't justify to myself spending to buy that thing because that's a whole hell of a lot of money. I, yeah, yeah, can't do it, but man, I would love to. Anyway, why do we take that big sidestep talking about camper vans? I don't know why, but there you go. Um, next up. Garden Variety Vagabond writes, Last week I sent in a long one on Reacher actor Alan Richson. Uh, I waited for the last one and thought I just posted later, but it looks like it never sent. I'd mentioned uh, um, I'd mentioned a car break-in that the, he witnessed in Montreal while he was vacationing with his wife. Uh, as he, as the deceased Paul Harvey would say, now for the rest of the story, after Alan's wife pleaded with him not to, he chased down the thief for four city blocks while dressed up for the night, out in a nice suit, caught him and threw him against the wall. Uh, he then called the police and held him down until they arrived. His dinner out was delayed. Life imitating art, real street vigilante justice. Well, I've heard that story. And listen, what do you do if you're a guy and you see a human being the size of Alan Richson chasing you down? That's got to be a terrifying sight. Terrifying sight. By the way, um, I'm very excited to see him in... Um, What's it called? The the something of ungentlemanly warfare. The new Guy Ritchie movie with Henry Cavill. I'm forgetting the first name of the title. It, it's not the League of, Unge of Ungentlemanly Warfare. The Ministry? The Division of Ungentlemanly Warfare? Help me out in the live chat, guys. What's what's the full name of the movie? Uh, the Something of Ungentlemanly Warfare. I can't remember the name of it. Um, ministry. Thank you. Lane, Lane Ford was the first one to put that in there. The Ministry of Ungentlemanly uh, Warfare. Alan Rich, I can't wait to see him. him seeing Alan Rich and Henry Cavill and some together, I think that's going to be a lot of fun, man. I'm excited about that. All right. Next up, our friend Murray Reich writes, After the Deadpool 3 teaser, I was thinking, will they explain to viewers who've never seen Loki what the TVA are? Uh, because some people who were lost when watching the Marvels and Doctor Strange 2, or do you think they'll ignore the events of Loki and make everything fresh? Well, here's the thing, Murray. We talked about this on the John Campus show earlier today. One of the brilliant things about the Deadpool trailer, one of the most absolutely brilliant things about the Deadpool trailer is if you never watched Loki, the TVA stuff didn't confuse you at all. Because the TVA just popped, like they made it so clear in the trailer. Hey, it's some kind of interdimensional police force who come and grab Deadpool and try to recruit him into helping them save the universe, right? Unlike trailers for the Marvels where people were watching, it's like, so who's that girl? And who's that other girl? And it feels like I'm supposed to know who they are and I have no idea who or what they are. Or people trying to watch Doctor Strange and Multiverse of Madness without watching WandaVision and going, wait a minute, when did Wanda turn bad? Well, in the in the WandaVision show, it kind of ends with her mind going a little bit crazy. But if there was a but in the Deadpool trailer, it wasn't confusing at all. This interdimensional police force shows up and says, We're here to recruit you, and they, they take you into recruit and they perfectly explain it. So even if you've never seen a single if you've never even heard of the Loki TV series, no one watching that trailer felt confused. And that was brilliant. And it looks like maybe they learned their lesson a little bit from the way they tried to um, um, market uh, the Marvels and stuff like that. And I thought it was really, really well done. So, no, I don't think anybody's going to be confused. I think you can watch that totally clean and totally be good. All right. Uh, Narf writes, so the 49ers have made it uh, to the Super Bowl three times in the last 11 years with three different quarterbacks and still lost all three. Yeah, but... Hell, it's better than the Detroit Lions who've never been to the Super Bowl in the last 50 years. It's better than the Buffalo Bills who haven't been to the Super Bowl in the last 20 or 30 years. 
it's better than almost every other name. You, like, listen, everybody's trying to like make this, ha ha, San Francisco sucks. Because why do they suck? Because they went to three Super Bowls and lost all of them. They went to three Super Bowls. That is the opposite of sucking. It means they are consistently really, really good. And maybe they didn't win the title, but they were consistently really, really awesome to get to the Super Bowl in three times in the last decade or so. Most teams can't say they did that. Most teams will most teams will never make it to three Super Bowls in a 10-year span. That's only happened a few times. So I think instead of being something that you mock them for, it's something that to me it's a it's a sign it's a it's a badge of honor. I mean they they deserve a lot of respect. I think. All right, last question from the uh, tip link comes to us from Jojo Giraffe who writes: <clears throat> Deadpool trailer mentions a happy ending. I get the joke, but do you think it's currently intended that the Deadpool movie will be with Ryan Reynolds? This will be the last Deadpool movie with Ryan Reynolds. No, I've already talked about that. Not at all. Obviously, box office number returns can change the plan, but do you think this is meant to be the last with Ryan? No, I, I don't. I, like I said earlier in the show, I believe that Marvel wouldn't see the, the purpose and Disney wouldn't see the purpose of investing a whole ton of time, money, energy, marketing, all that kind of stuff for a one and done movie. For a one night stand, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, out the door, done. I think... And this is just me as a fan speculating, okay? So take this with a huge grain of salt. This is just me guessing. But what I believe probably happened is that they probably said to Ryan Reynolds, okay, yeah, we'll do another, we'll do a Deadpool movie and we'll let you have total free reign. You can make pegging jokes and sex. You can do as, make it as hard R as you want and all that kind of stuff. But it's got to be worth our while. It's got to be worth our while. Um you got to do it. You got to make a commitment of like maybe two movies, probably three movies. I'm guessing make a commitment so we can get a lot out of our investment in this. And, um, and we'll go hall second. My, my wife is texting me. My wife has just spent the day at Disneyland. She saw Patrick Mahomes. She sent me a picture of Patrick Mahomes. Actually, I'll show you the picture she just sent me. I don't know if I can get it on the screen or not, though. Give me a second. Can I get it on the screen? Maybe. Will this open here? Maybe it will. Nope, nope, not going to open. Okay, I, I can't get the picture on screen, but she took a picture of uh, Patrick Mahomes at Disneyland today. Uh, so I'm just going to text her back. Uh, okay, baby. She's texting me saying she's on her way back from Disneyland. Uh, I'm live on the air right now. Our viewers say... Hello. Um, there we go. There. Okay, so I've uh, answered my wife's text message. Little life lesson, guys. Doesn't matter what you're doing. I don't care if you're doing a live streaming show. When your wife texts you, you text her back. Okay. Um, so, yes. No, I don't believe this is going to be <coughs> Ryan Reynolds' final one uh, at all. Um, all right, guys. Listen, we're going to jump over to the live questions that you guys have been sending in. But before we get to those, and by the way, if, you've, if you want to send in a live super chat, um, you've got about 60 seconds left to do it, and then I'm going to turn off the super chat, okay? So you got about 60 seconds to do it. Um, so before we get to the live super chats that you guys have been sending in, we're going to take another quick second and thank a couple of more sponsors of today's episode, our friends at Fume and Harry's. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Fume. Have you ever tried to break a bad habit and it felt like you're climbing uphill? Yeah, well, we've been there too. But here's a breath of fresh air, Fume. It's not about giving up, it's about switching up. Fume takes your habit and simply makes it better, healthier, and a whole lot more enjoyable. Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors. You get it, instead of 
bad fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and make replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. I'll be honest with you guys, I was a little uncertain about it until my package arrived and I tried it. I couldn't believe how perfectly balanced it is, how fun it is to have in your hands and how great the actual flavor was. Plus, Fume just released a magnetic stand for your fume, so there's no more losing it around the house. So start the year off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com slash campia and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use my code campia to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Harry's. You know, guys, in order to start the John Campia show, I had to leave my high paying corporate job in order to set myself up to be happier and enjoy more personal success. Because sometimes to get what you want, you have to challenge the status quo and blaze your own trail. And that's exactly what the folks at Harry's did. You see, at Harry's, they saw customers getting ripped off by questionable products in the shaving industry and decided to do something better. Harry's decided to pave their own road by making beautifully designed razors for a fraction of the price of the other big brands, except exceptional products, honest prices. That's Harry's. I have fallen in love with Harry's from their foaming shaving gel that feels just luxurious on the skin to their incredible razor that feels just as good in the hand as it does going over your skin. They've got rich lathering skin softening body wash and scents like redwood, wildlands, and stone. You see, Harry's provides German engineered blades made in their own factory that stay sharp longer. You can get a five blade razor, weighted handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel cover for just three bucks at harrys.com slash campia. Don't settle for the status quo. Blaze your own trail with Harry's. Get started with a $13 trial set for just $3 at harrys.com slash campia. That's harrys.com slash campia for a $3 trial set. And thank you to our friends at Harry's and Fume for sponsoring today's episode. All right, guys, with that down, let's get over to your live questions, shall we? That you guys have been firing in uh, via the Super Chats. We're going to start things off here with Raymond Verado, who says, Ben Wang is cast as the new Karate Kid. You know what? I saw that news headline. Well, obviously, we'll talk about this on the John Campbell Show tomorrow. I saw that news headline come in. I don't know who he is. Um, so I don't know if that's supposed to mean something to me, but I, I'm guessing this is the one that he's going to be in with Jackie Chan, I'm guessing. So, yeah. Uh, Ray and Virata also write, congrats to Christopher Nolan for his DGA award. Of course, Christopher Nolan won Best Director of the Year at the Directors Guild of America. We're going to talk about that a little bit on tomorrow's show as well. So good on him for finally getting that award. Uh, next up, we got Dante Siraccia who writes, I don't see Marvel making this Deadpool a variant from a different universe. Neither do I. But Shatterstar died in Deadpool 2, right? Uh, is this a variant Deadpool we're following in the third installment? I sure hope not. No, what they're simply going to do is say that, of course, in the post credit scene of Deadpool 2, Deadpool takes Cable's time-traveling device, Negasonic fixes it for him, and he starts running around fixing a bunch of things he wants to fix. And we saw him save Peter uh, from X-Force, so it's easy for them just to say that he saved Shatterstar as well. There's going to be a lot of changes that he makes. So it's not a variant of the Deadpool we know. This is just the Deadpool who went around and changed a bunch of stuff in that Fox Universe timeline to save some of his friends, I believe. Uh, did he save Brad Pitt, though? Because remember, Brad Pitt was the invisible guy. Maybe he saved Brad Pitt. I mean, that, that would be kind of cool for them to do. All right. Next up. <clears throat> We've got Robert Presser, who writes, I loved how the only surprise cameo we got in Deadpool 3 was Pyro. I hope in the first main trailer they keep surprises cameos to a minimum. I really, do, I honestly don't think it makes one lick of difference. I really don't. Everybody says, I want to be surprised. It makes no difference. I know everybody disagrees. Well, not everybody disagrees with me about this, but a lot of people disagree, and that's fine. But... <clears throat> We all know Jennifer Garner is going to be in it, right? Is it going to get any less of a pop when Jennifer Garner pops up on screen? Here's the other thing. <coughs> they showed Patrick Stewart as Professor Charles Xavier in the Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness trailer. It was still the biggest pop. 
when he came out. Everybody knew he was there. They literally showed a glimpse of it in the trailer. But when he came out in Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness, the theater went crazy. Everybody knew John Krasinski was going to be Reed Richards in Doctor Strange. That, that, that had been, <coughs> it was, everybody knew. And yet, when he came out as Reed Richards, everybody lost their minds. The fact that people knew in advance made zero difference. <coughs> Michael Gonzalez, <coughs> pardon me guys, Michael Gonzalez brings up a good point. The only real surprise was that Black Bolt was in there. But the Black Bolt one, even though it was a pure surprise to everybody, the Black Bolt appearance didn't get near the pop that the Professor Xavier one did, even though everybody knew it, and John Krasinski did, even though everybody knew in advance. See, everybody always says, no, 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 it's got to be a surprise. You can say that, but my experience actually being in movie theaters is that it never makes any difference. It never makes any difference. None. So I really don't think, um, I really don't think it's going it's to make any difference whatsoever. I, I really, really don't. So <coughs> I think they should put some of the cameos in, particularly the ones we already know about. Patrick Stewart's already hinted that he's going to be in there. We already know it's official that Jennifer Garner's going to be in there. It's practically official that Halle Berry is going to be in there. So show the ones that we already know about. If there's ever, if there are a couple of big surprises, yeah, leave the surprises, but... <clears throat> I think for the most part, it's just not going to matter. I, again, I, I know a bunch of people disagree with me on that. I'm just saying that's what I have always tangibly witnessed, that it's never made a difference. But eh, whatever. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Next up. Gray Fox writes, Wild Theory. Could the bald head in the trailer belong to James McAvoy's Professor X? It could be. They could also be any one of a million characters that are bald. Right. The big funny thing was people are running around like, oh, that's Cassandra Nova, Charles Xavier's twin sister. Why? What at all in the trailer suggested that's who that was? It's a bald head. Well, then it must be a, a, an Xavier, right? Um, could be. I mean, it could be Cassandra Nova. It could also be a James McAvoy Professor X, it could be, although it didn't look like that. It looked like, in fairness to the people who kind of think it might be Cassandra Nova, it does look like a female's head. It looks like a female shape of his head. <laughs> this is good. Um, say, obviously it's Drax. There you go. Obviously it's Drax. Um, anyway, yeah, I'll, but we'll see. We'll see. It's certainly possible. 100% it's possible, but we'll see. All right. Next up, Demarius Love writes, will you be doing an after show for Shogun? Yes, I will be. I was 12 or 13 when the original show was aired. That was a miniseries. Uh, and don't remember much besides uh, Shaka Zulu. It was my favorite series back then. Yeah, man, it was... I, I saw. I mean, I was younger than 12 or 13 when that miniseries was out. But um, I just remember it made a very long-lasting impression on me. Richard Chamberlain, John Reese davies um, who's Gimli in the Lord of the Rings films and Sala in the Indiana Jones films. Angle. Um, I've been dying for this show for a long time. And even though I don't really do, um, any after shows anymore, I am going to be doing a Shogun after show. I am going to be doing that. So keep your guys open. I, I, I know not a lot of people are going to watch it. That's fine, but I'm going to do one anyway. Cause I can't wait for this show. All right. Uh, Hosea XCI writes, what did you think of Usher's halftime performance? I thought it was quite good. Yeah, it, it wasn't the best halftime show, but I thought it was quite good. Yeah, it was. It popped. It was it was really good. It was fun. It was fun to watch. Uh, let's see. Uh, Matthew Brown writes, hey, John, I hope you had a great day. Do you still think Bob Iger can still fix Disney? 100%. He's already doing the right things to fix Disney. I don't think he imagined the problems being this bad coming back and doesn't look like it'll be fixed for a while. Listen, one of the things I always tell people when a new ownership comes in or a new CEO or whatever, or a new head of a cinematic universe is, you and I are not going to see the results of this leadership change for years. 
for minimum a year and a half to two years, you're not going to see the results. Like James Gunn, <clears throat> right? James Gunn has taken over the DCU. But we haven't had a chance to see the effects of any, like this movie he's making, Superman Legacy. It wouldn't come out until years after he becomes the CEO of Disney, right? Like a lot of people say, ah, J James Gunn's is the Flash failed. James Gunn had nothing to do with the Flash. That was a movie that was produced, shot, post-produced, and ready to go into theaters long before he ever became CEO, co-CEO with Peter Safran of DC. When Bob Chapek took over as CEO of Disney, a, a, a move I liked at the time, I thought Bob Chapek, I admit this, I thought Bob Chapek at the time was the right guy to hire. It made sense on paper. Just like Kathleen Kennedy taking over Lucasfilm made sense on paper when she took it over. George Lucas handpicked her. She's one of the greatest producers of all time. It made sense on paper. But just because it makes sense on paper doesn't mean it works out. And I, But I said when Bob Chapek took over, listen, you're not going to feel the effects of Bob Chapek taking over for at least a year or two, right? And even when he made his brain-dead, idiotic administrative changes, tr taking creative power away from the creatives, creating new layers of mid middle management with financial and banker people and all that kind of stuff. We still didn't see the effects of that till much further down the road. And then we started feeling the effects and seeing the effects and, and that it had and was, but so when Bob Iger came back, I told everybody, it's going to take a year or two years for us to see and feel the difference that his decisions today are going to make. We're, like he's going to make decisions and we're not going to feel the impact of those decisions for another year or two, maybe year and a half, two and a half years. But he's already made a bunch of really good moves. And one of the very first things he did was he gave the creative power back to the creatives. He removed those middle layers of management that Bob Chapek put into place. He's, he's, he's already announced they're scaling back on some things to focus more on quality. But we're not going to feel the effects of these for at least another year, year and a half, right? It's still going to be a while till we feel the effects. So, uh, yes, as Dat Boy says, change doesn't happen overnight. Do any of you guys who saw Succession, in season one, Brian Cox, the, the, main, the main guy in the show, he's at a board meeting and people are resisting him. And he says, I'm trying to steer a fucking oil tanker. Which means it takes a lot of time and effort. You can't just turn a wheel of an oil tanker and the oil tanker goes, Vee! no, it goes over, over time. It's slowly. Slow. And like Brian Cox saying that show is a really good example of what's going on here. So we'll see. We'll see. All right. Next up. Uh, we got John Redcorn who writes, uh, who had the better slap? Rock slapped to Cody Rhodes or Will slaps to Chris Rock? <coughs> I didn't watch the WWE press conference thing. Um, I meant to go watch it because everybody said it was really good, but I never saw it. But Will slap will reverberate through history. So I'm going to say that's the more significant slap. All right. Brendan Mispaw writes, Am I the only one who assumes Marvel is probably just going to return to mediocrity after this? I see no indicators that this will change at all. Then you're not paying attention, Brendan. Remember that something major has happened. Bob Iger came back. He gave Kevin Feige his actual creative control back, which, he had which Bob Chapek had taken away from him and given it to bankers. And what we've seen <clears throat> is that Kevin Feige has already made a couple of significant moves. Number one, he scrapped everything they did on Captain America 4 and said, this thing they were trying to get us to rush out the door, it's not good enough. We are going to do it my way now, says Kevin Feige. We're going to reshoot a whole bunch of this and we're going to make this a much better movie. He looked at Daredevil and said, I know they're trying to get us to rush us out for Disney Plus and they didn't want us to make it the Netflix one, but this isn't working. What we've made so far is not great. And now that I'm in charge again, 
I'm saying we're going to scrap this. We're going to go back to the drawing board. We're going to incorporate this, this, and this, and we're going to make this a better show. And it's going to take time for us to see the differences, right? Every movie we've seen come out so far has all been movies that were put together and made under the Chapek era. So <clears throat> you're going to have to give it time. But just seeing that they're doing that, seeing that Bob Iger is saying, we're going to focus more on quality. We're not going to crank out so much stuff to go to Disney+. Plus. All the right decisions are being made. Now it's just going to take us another year, two years to see the actual results. But I 100% believe they've been making the right decisions. I 100% believe they're making the right decisions now. So we'll see what happens. I mean, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. But I think it looks good right now. We'll see. All right, Matthew Brown writes, I think we could see DC and Marvel switch places with DC going on a great run while Marvel trails. Maybe, but here's the problem. People have said that before over the past 10 years, right? It became like, you could set your watch to it. When a new DC trailer would come out, because the DCEU trailers, say what you want about the DCEU, their trailers were generally really, really good. Their, their trailers were generally really good. But it would never fail. <clears throat> Every time a great DC trailer would come out, the social media conversation was, R.I.P. Marvel, rest in peace, Marvel's dead now because DC's about to rule, right? Every single fucking time a great DCEU trailer would come out. And most of them were great. They made great trailers. But every time that would happen, somebody would say, rest in peace, Marvel. Marvel's time is over. And what happened? That was never the case. It never happened. And certainly I have said that I believe right now that Disney or DC may be in a little bit of a better position because they get to start with a clean slate and get everything going from scratch and from start with a fresh start. <coughs> but now that Bob Chapek's gone, now that Kevin Feige has his authority back, we'll see, man. Look, what is in everybody's best interests is to have two thriving, successful comic book cinematic universe is going at the same time, not one dominating the other. What is best for all of us is to have both of them doing great. That's when we as fans win. You and I as fans win when we have two thriving, successful, entertaining cinematic universes going at the same time. And here's hoping that's what we get. And maybe one will be a little bit better than the other or vice versa, but that's when we as fans win. So here's hoping that that's what happens. All right. Next up, Mr. Godzilla writes, Deadpool being a critical and box office success will be good for Marvel, but they need more wins after Deadpool 3 to keep the success up. 100%. 100%. Listen, winning cures everything. It does. But you can easily fall back, right? You can easily fall back. A great, successful, entertaining Deadpool film will win them a lot of favor with the fans. Enough favor that even if the next Disney Plus show isn't so good, it can survive that. But no matter how good Deadpool 3 is, you can win back the audience, but you can lose them again. <clears throat> you know that saying? Success isn't bought, it's rented. And the rent is due every damn day. I'm sure many of you have heard that, but if you haven't, let me say it again and burn it into your mind. Success is not bought. It's rented. And the rent is due every day. <clears throat> Marvel can't think that they can just put out one um, great movie and then they, then they can just lay back, lean back and rest on their laurels, right? Right? They cannot believe that. They have to know that <coughs> they need to continue to work and work and work to make sure they're always putting out top-notch. And listen, they can have the odd bump in the road. That's fine. 
Not everything is going to be an eight or nine or 10 out of 10. They're going to have the odd bump in the road and that's okay. But they have to show their audience that they are always consistently working their asses off to deliver top tier content. And if they do that and they put out the odd stinker, then we're okay with that, right? It's hard making good movies. You're not going to succeed every time. But they've got to know they can't just put out a great Deadpool 3 movie and go, okay, now we've won again. We don't have to put much up. We don't have to worry about it now. No, 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 no. Success is rented and the rent is due every day. And uh, <clears throat> they got to remember that, Mr. Godzilla. You're 100% right about that, man. All right. Nico writes, John, what do you think about the game? Mahomes was Mahomes, but I thought uh, get the Chiefs defense really stepped up when it counted. Can they three-peat? Here's the thing. Mahomes was Mahomes in overtime. The reality is they only scored one touchdown in the, in, in the game. Not counting overtime, they only managed to score one touchdown. And that touchdown they got because a San Francisco 49er, a fluke happened where the falling punt hit the back of their ankle and Kansas got the ball in the red zone. And that's the only reason they scored one touchdown. So I don't agree that Mahomes was Mahomes. Mahomes has been shaky the last couple of games. He wasn't that great against the Baltimore Ravens. They only scored 17 points that game. He wasn't that great until overtime against the 49ers. They couldn't put any points on the board. They had only scored 16 points going into the last minute of the fourth quarter. But it was a great game. It was a great game. The Kansas City Chiefs are officially a dynasty. Uh, Mahomes is a very, very special player. And uh, here's the thing. The Kansas City Chiefs were not the best team this year. They should have lost to Baltimore and they should have lost to San They had the games handed to them. This Kansas City Chief team this year was not as good as the Kansas City Chiefs team of the last couple of years. And I don't think, unless they make some significant changes, I don't think they're going to be as good next year. And Travis Kelsey is going to retire in the next couple of years. And the Kansas City Chiefs are not the same when Travis Kelsey isn't there. So can they replace those pieces? Can they do what the New England Patriots did, which was reinvent the team every three or four years to create this decades-long dynasty? Can the Kansas City Chiefs do that? And here's the thing. Andy Reid's going to retire soon. He might even retire this offseason. So... We'll see. And Dee's Webos is right, man. The AFC is tough, man. The AFC is tough. So uh, we'll see. But hey, hats off. Three Super Bowl rings from Mahomes already. He still has four to go to catch Tom Brady. But man, how many quarterbacks in NFL history can say they have three Super Bowl rings? Not many. Not many. All right. <clears throat> Big Hoss writes. Any Venom 3 rumors? Just wondering if you heard any. No. I haven't heard any rumors, and I don't generally care about the rumors. I loved the first Venom movie. I don't care what anybody else says. You can say, you can talk, talk, talk all you want. I thought the first Venom film was great. Uh, the second Venom film wasn't as good, but I still had a good time with it. It was still fun to me. So I'm excited about the third one, but I haven't really heard much about it at this point. So we'll see. All right. Thanks, Big Hoss. Next up, we got Bobby Jackson who writes, Here's a what if I'd like to ponder. What if Disney never bought 20th Century Fox? Then who or what could save the MCU if not Deadpool? I mean, that's a really good question. But I mean, so much would be different, right? Like Marvel's entire roadmap would be different right now had they not bought Fox. They wouldn't be having mutants coming in and they wouldn't be building towards a fantastic four and they wouldn't be doing a lot of this stuff so it's a great question but it's really who knows maybe they'd be in a better position right now if they'd never bought fox i'm not saying they would be i'm just saying theoretically maybe they would be but that's that's a really good question to ponder bobby i don't know what the answer to that is but i think it's a great question to ponder all right james wheeler writes Hello, John. Just wondering, do you prefer Real Steel or Free Guy? Free Guy. Real Steel is great, though. For those of you who don't know, Real Steel was... what Guys in the live chat, help me out. What year did that come out? 
I, I, it was, had to be over 10 years ago, right? That Real Steel came out. Real Steel is this movie with Hugh Jackman about like robot boxing. A lot of people would jo joke and say, Jason, uh, Jake Clark is saying it came out in 2011. So, um, so like 13 years ago. A lot of people jokingly called it Rock'em Sock'em Robots. But Sugar Ray Leonard did the fight choreography for that movie. I got to sit down and interview Sugar Ray Leonard. Oh, it's one of the greatest moments of my career, getting to walk into a room and sit down one-on-one -on -one with Sugar Ray Leonard. One of the greatest moments ever. Anyway, that's a side thing. The movie is wonderful. It's got great heart, real emotion, a um, lot of fun, great music in it too. Um, I just love that movie, but I think Free Guy was even better. I, so I love both of those movies, but I think if I had to pick one, James, I love them both. I love Real Steel, but I think I would go with Free Guy. I think Free Guy was just fantastic. All right. <clears throat> Andy Hiller writes, or Hillier writes, more on tour news. Come to UK. I'll show you and Ray great British fish and chips. It's my industry. You'll sell shows, podcast shows. Very popular here. You know what's funny? I've always been told ever since the movie blog days, uh, back when I used to do my website, the movie blog, I was always shocked when I would look at the statistics and see how many people in the UK um, watched and, and read my website and listened to our podcast. I'm just curious. I don't even know what time it is in the UK right now. Are any of you guys watching live right now? It might be the middle of the night in the UK. I have no idea. Any of you guys watching live right now in the UK? Just, just fire off yes if you are. Um, <clears throat> but that would be a very expensive trip. I've always wanted to go to London. Michael is writing yes, and it's 2 a.m. Good on you. Well, somebody else is saying it's 4 a.m. in the UK, but... Uh, Michael is in the UK right now saying it's 2 a.m. Good on you for doing that. Gray Fox is saying it's almost 2 a.m. here. Thank you very much for watching me this late at night, my friends. Um, yeah, the problem, of course, I've always wanted to go to London. The problem is, of course, it's a very, very, very expensive trip. It's one thing for us to like go to San Francisco or one thing for us to go to Buffalo or, or whatever, but to fly to London is a huge expense. So I don't know if we'll be able to be able to do that, um, but I would love to. If we could get a sponsor in the UK to pay for it, I know that's a pipe dream. But I mean, if we could get a sponsor in the UK to pay for the trip, I would do it. I've always wanted to go, man. 100% I've always wanted to go. All right. Uh, next up, Gene Checks writes, five ants moved into a house with five other ants. They became 10 ants. Get it? Tenants. You know what, actually, Gene, I'll give you the drum hit for that. I'll give you the drum hit for that. That That's actually not not bad. No, that's not bad. Uh, okay. Uh, next up, we've got, uh, Gene also writes, Campia didn't screw Collider. Collider screwed Collider. Yes, they did. Look, here's the thing. I, I don't want to speak badly um, <clears throat> of Collider or anything. Look, I have a rule, and I think I've always followed this rule. I, I mean, there, there have been, there was one time I know that I didn't, and I've always regretted that I didn't, and this is going back years, but I have a rule. Um, whereas there are some people out there who see social media as a place to pull a Costanza and do airing of the grievances. You see those people? There are even people I really respect who, who, who will often, people I know and respect and like, but that look at social media as, this is my platform to air my grievances. Everybody, everybody, I want to tell you all about why I think that person sucks. Here's what this person said to me once and they use it as like airing of the grievances. I'm like, grow the fuck up. Grow the fuck up. Fucking children. Like, I remember, I don't know. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. But I, I have a rule with myself. I don't 
do that. I don't get into shit slinging contests with people because you've heard me say this before. My daddy always said, the only thing that is guaranteed to happen when you get in a shit slinging contest is everyone ends up smelling like shit, right? So I've always made a rule for myself. I don't get online and talk about people unless I have nice things to say, right? I, I don't get online and talk about personal beefs. Now, there, there was that one situation where that one dude who I had never met in my life, but started bad mouthing all the people who Collider was fired. The, the one of the, the guys in, who was in leadership over at Collider, this is long after I had left. And they, they decided to lay all the people off and they start, and this guy decided to bad mouth a bunch of the people that getting laid off and decided to bad mouth the shows I had created. And I can't even remember that guy's name. And you guys remember that guy's name? I don't even remember his name, whatever. But in that situation, I felt like I had to say something, right? They were shutting down all the shows that I had created that were successful until I left because they didn't know how to run things. And they laid off a lot of good people. And I understood it's business. Sometimes you got to lay people off, but you don't then shit talk people that you're laying off. You don't do that. And I kind of felt like I needed to say something, but here's the thing. I'm not going to say that I didn't have my own personal issues with some individuals at Collider. I did, but I've never talked about them publicly and I never will. You know why? Because it's nobody's fucking business. I don't need to be a fucking four-year-old and get on social media and say, everybody, everybody, time for me to do my airing of the grievances. I don't do that. I have never once... <clears throat> Whenever I've had to let people go, like what I have talked about is like, oh, you know what? Like, like me and Mark Fernandez, we had a philosophical difference, right? I got, me and Mark got along great. <clears throat> Mark, Mark and I actually got along very well. And to this day, like every, not, not regularly anymore, but every once in a while, <clears throat> Mark will just out of the blue, drop me a text message, say, hey, hope you're doing well. I, I believe I've done that in the last year or so. Fire, fired him off a text message. Hey, hope you're doing well. You know, Mark and I always got along personally very well. We had some philosophical differences and we aired our philosophical differences. You know, that was fine. There was never anything personal. We always got along. We sat down, broke bread together, all that kind of stuff. Um, but um, when I was running AMC or when I was running uh, Clyder, uh, even then there would be times there had been times that I had to fire people and never once have I ever gone on any public forum and explained why I fired them because that's none of anybody's business except for the person that got fired. Now, if the person that got fired wants to share with the world why they got fired, that's on them. They can do that, <clears throat> but I wasn't going to air anybody else's dirty laundry. <clears throat> Like, I'm not, I'm going to make up a situation, okay? Just to be clear, this did not happen, okay? This did not happen. I'm making up a scenario to give an example. But like if I caught an employee stealing equipment from the, from the company, which never happened, okay? Again, are we clear? This never, I'm totally making up a hypothetical situation, right? But if I caught somebody stealing equipment from the company and I fired them, I won't go online and say, this person was stealing stuff from the company. How would you, and people would say, you owe everybody an explanation. I would say to them, let's say your boss fired you for something from your job. Would you appreciate it if they got on social media and told the world, hey, everybody, hey, everybody, I want you to know why I fired Harry over here. No, that wouldn't be very nice. It wouldn't be professional and it serves no purpose. It serves no purpose other to, than to sling shit, right? So I never did, never once, never once did I get on and tell and fire where I had to fire somebody and go online and, and talk about firing somebody. Now, <clears throat> is everything I ever said about Collider true? 
that we had some philosophical differences. They were starting to go in a direction that I wasn't very happy with. And I decided I didn't want to be a hindrance to the direction they wanted to take things. So I decided to leave and do my own thing. All that is true. That's all true. That's not to say I didn't have some personal issues with some individuals. I did, but I never talked about it. I never aired it out. I never acted like a fucking child and got on social media and go, nye, 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 nye. No, I never did that once and I never will. Um, I'm trying to decide what I can and can't say. Trying to decide what I can and can't say. Well, you know, it's it's better. <clears throat> um, Bobby Jackson saying, "What if a person lies about the reason that they got fired and slandered you? Would you speak up and set the record straight?" I'm going to tell you what, Bobby, that has happened, and I did. I still did not say anything, not a thing. That very specific situation you just mentioned has happened, and I did not say a thing. You know why I didn't say a thing? Because it didn't matter. It didn't matter. It didn't affect me in the least. And what would there to be gained other than personal vindictiveness? What would there have been to be gained? The reality is when it has happened, I've been in a much better position in life than the other person was. So what's the point? What's the point? And then I'm going to put that person in their place. Nope. I just, and I never said a thing. I never addressed it. I never spoke about it. And I never have, and I never will. <clears throat> because what is there to be gained? Right? There was nothing to be gained other than just to Feel the personal satisfaction of being vindictive. And hey, th there's a certain dark appeal to that, isn't there? To us as people to want to be darkly vindictive. Sure there is. Of course there is. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, will that make your life easier? No. It wouldn't have made my life easier. It wouldn't have solved any problems. It wouldn't have done anything constructive. Nothing, const if, if somebody could have told me, here's a constructive thing that would come about if you do this, then maybe I consider it. But acting out of pure childish spite and vindictiveness and stuff like that, and we've all done it, we're all guilty of it from time to time, let's admit it, we all are, but does anything good ever come out of that? And again, I'm not talking about philosophical difference paradigm opinions and things. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about that stuff, the, 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 the petty vindictive stuff. Nothing good comes out of it. It feels good for a second. Like saying something really nasty to somebody it feels good for a second. And then you're tainted by it. Like it's just, it's just something, it's not good. And I think the older I get, the more cognizant I am of stuff like that, that there's stuff worth and we've gone way off track here, but there's stuff worth getting riled up about and there's stuff that isn't. So anyway, <clears throat> that that's a little side talk. Um, uh, that's a little side talk that I don't need to, that we've spent enough time on, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, all from a little comment that Gene made. All right. Uh, S. Macaulay 600 writes. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to say it. The bigoted, toxic fans killed the MCU. Nope. Because here's the things. There were bigoted, toxic fans, some of them. There were some bigoted and toxic fans while the MCU was doing great. But as long as the MCU kept cranking out great stuff, all the crybabies saying, Marvel pays for good reviews. Oh, you don't know how fucking stupid you sound. And Marvel does this and they're, trying, they're sabotaging the DC. You know, all the idiotic stuff. None of it mattered because Marvel was continuing to put out high, high quality stuff. And I, I heard somebody once say the best way to beat a bully is to succeed and be happy in life. And, and that's very good wisdom. The best way to beat a bully is to succeed in life and be happy in life. That's the best, best way to win. But for the longest time, even though all that dark muck dredging low lives were around, 
Marvel was immune because they continued to put out high quality, high entertainment, high success stuff. But when their stuff started to lower in quality, then you're not as immune. <clears throat> because even the most pathetic mom's basement dwelling cousin humper, some of the nonsense they say, some of it will start to, like when the quality comes down, it, it, it almost gives some credence to it. Like they were saying it all the time, but when Marvel was still cranking out good stuff. So here's the thing. Marvel has nobody to blame except themselves. There are always going to be bigoted and toxic fans out there in everything, in video games, in music, in shoes, in, in tech, in movies, in TV. There's always going to be bigoted, toxic fans. But it's still on you because if you create high quality stuff consistently, you are impervious to all of that nonsense. And Marvel was for many years. They were completely impervious to it because they continued to put out great stuff. But when they stop putting out consistently great stuff, it becomes more noticeable. And, and honestly, while I do not endorse any of the cousin humping and stuff like that that's out there, Marvel has nobody to blame but themselves. If they want to fix it, just keep making great content. Get back to making consistently great content. And if you do, all the MCU crybabies, nobody pays attention to them because you're putting out high quality, high success rate, big box office, big success. It makes you immune again. So no, it's not the basement dwellers fault. It's Marvel's fault. They have nobody to blame but themselves. And they are their own potential saviors. They are their own Marvel Jesus, if you will. They can fix it, but it's up to them to fix it. Anyway, uh, next up, John Redcorn. Bob Marley reviews aren't great. Oh, that's too bad to hear. I've, I'm not big on musical biopics normally. There are certainly a couple that I love, but I'm not big on musical biopics, but I've been getting very interested in this Bob Marley movie. That's sad to hear that the reviews aren't good. Um, <clears throat> next up. Uh, we've got, uh, Gnome writes, just watched American fiction. Great movie. It's fantastic. Uh, overall, but I don't know what I feel about the ending mixed bag for me. Jeffrey Wright was fantastic though. Yeah. I'm not going to say what the, um, <coughs> I'm not going to say what the ending was cause I don't want to give it away, but the movie is fantastic. And I'm with you about the very ending like the ending wasn't as iffy as the ending of iss iss was another movie i enjoyed very much but i it's a very questionable ending i didn't think the ending to american fiction was like super questionable but it wasn't wasn't the best um wasn't the best ending uh to a movie but other than that man the performances the story the characters uh, I the premise was great. It was a little bit of a different movie than I was expecting, but I had a great time with it. And listen, listen, <clears throat> Jeffrey Wright might shock the world. Look, if I had to put five bucks on who's going to win Best Actor at the Academy Awards, I will put it on uh, Killian Murphy. I, I'll put my five bucks on Killian Murphy winning Best Actor at the Academy Awards. But all I'm saying is, don't be shocked. If Jeffrey Wright shocks the world when they read from the card and the best actor Oscar goes to Jeffrey Wright, I'm just saying, don't be shocked. I think it's going to be Killian Murphy, but man, Jeffrey Wright is good in this movie, dude. He's so good in it. All right. Fang Blaze 71 writes, um, I'm sure it's unlikely, but how funny would it be if Deadpool accidentally goes to the DCU and someone says this universe is already dead, buddy? Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's 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 not that's not gonna happen. First of all, like, and I wish fandom, both DC and Marvel fans, would learn a lesson from the people who run those universes. Kevin Feige cheers for the DCU. Kevin Feige cheers for DC to have successful stuff. And the people involved in DC cheer for Marvel to have successful stuff. Because guess what? If Guardians of the Galaxy 3 
did not make over $800 million, it wouldn't have made $1 of difference to how much money The Flash made. It wouldn't have made a single difference. It's not like, oh, I want them to fail so I can succeed. Like, for some reason, us fans seem to think that. That, oh, if the other guy fails, then my stuff will do better. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. If Guardians of the Galaxy 3 completely flopped, it wouldn't have made Blue Beetle and it wouldn't have made Flash earn one extra dollar. Not one. <clears throat> Kevin Feige and James Gunn understand and know. First of all, they're very close, but they understand and know that most of the casual movie going audience doesn't look at DC titles and Marvel titles. They look at comic book movies as a genre as a whole, right? They just see, oh, this new comic book movie. And they understand that when a person goes out, when an average film fan just goes out to a movie and they have a great time and it's a, it's a superhero movie, if they have a great time at that superhero, they are more likely, not guaranteed, but more likely to want to come back to the movie theaters in the next couple of weeks to see the next superhero movie, right? It's the old adage of, of a rising tide right, raises all ships. I mean, that's not always true, but I mean, there's a, there's a truism to that in the world of movies. It is in DC's best interest for Marvel to be making great movies, and it's in Marvel's best interest for DC to be making great movies. And um, in as much as the heads of those cinematic universes cheer for each other, I wish we as movie fans would cheer for each other as well. For too long, there's been a tribalism. It's not as bad today as it was a couple of years ago, but there's this really horrible, toxic tribalism where it's like, I'm a DC fan, and that means I'm supposed to hate everything Marvel, and I'm a Marvel fan, which means I think everything DC is crap. When really, like when both are making great movies, that's when we as fans win. And, what, and, and if I'm more of a fan of, if you're somebody who's like, say, more of a fan of DC than Marvel, that's fine. As fans, we should be cheering for the other guys too. We should be cheering for them. Hopefully they're cheering for us. And hopefully as a fandom, we all get even, you know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of, I don't know. What's a like, um, <clears throat> resident evil. I'm not a fan of the resident evil franchise. Okay. But you know what? When new resident evil movies come out, they may not be for me, but I hope they're great for my fellow fans who do enjoy those movies because I want them to have a great time. And maybe not everybody is a Venom fan, but I hope that if you're not a Venom fan, I hope that you're cheering when I get when I go to see Venom that you're hoping Venom's going to be good just so I can have a good time. And I, I, I wish that was the state that fandom would be in. Anyway, <coughs> that's kind of what I'm hoping happens. All right. Uh, next up, we've got Murray Reich, who writes, um, other than No Way Home, all my friends in my circles didn't care watching, let me try this again, other than No Way Home, all my friends in my circles didn't care watching any Marvel movie until they saw new Deadpool trailer where their reaction was, fuck it, let's pay for a damn babysitter. <laughs> yeah, man, listen, I I'll tell you what. The reaction online has been really, really positive. It's been really positive. And it's just step one, right? I, I said on the John Campus show earlier today, I think we are in for five months of wild online shenanigans between Hugh Jackman, Ryan Reynolds, other actors who are going to be involved in the film are going to start posting wild stuff. I think we are going to be in for a really entertaining five months of a very, very visceral grounded gorilla marketing campaign for this movie. I, I think we're in for a really good time. And I think that trailer got a lot of people going, screw it. Let's go see this movie. And I hope it works, man. I really do. Mason Thurman writes, uh, Stephen Lang as Ross, better casting. I think, yes. Listen, I love Stephen Lang. For those of you who don't know, he was Quaritch in uh, the Avatar movies. He's, he's, I love Stephen Lang. I've had him in my studio. He came in for me to do an interview with him. That's when he called me. I want you to call me slang. All right, slang. So I refer to Stephen Lang as slang. He insisted. He likes being referred to as slang. <clears throat> I love slang, man. I love Stephen Lang. He's great. Um, 
No, he would not have been a better Thunderbolt Ross. The the Thunderbolt Ross that William Hurt played is would not have been better picked up by Stephen Lang. Stephen Lang would have been a very different Thunderbolt Ross, right? We've already got our Thunderbolt Ross in the MCU. And Harrison Ford is coming in and not creating a new Thunderbolt Ross. He's picking up the baton for William Hurt. Something that I wish they did for T'Challa. But they've got Harrison Ford coming in to pick up the baton for William Hurt to carry on that character. Now, I'm sure William or um, Harrison Ford will bring a little bit um, of his own isms to it, for sure. Uh, Harrison Ford will bring a little, will put his own little thumbprint on it, but for the most part, he's playing that character. And seeing as that character has already been established, I I, I do think that Harrison Ford is the better um, actor to come in and pick up that baton. If it was a completely brand new Thunderbolt Ross and we're doing a Thunderbolt Ross from scratch, Stephen Lang would be a really cool choice. But I, I think to replace William Hurt, I think Harrison Ford is the better choice. But that's just that's just my take on it at any rate. Um, you can never go wrong with slang, though, man. <laughs> He's great. John uh, Leone writes, <clears throat> With the growing popularity of Sonic, first two movies, Knuckles Show, new games being well-received, do you think the third movie could reach a billion dollars? No chance in hell. Nope. No chance in hell. Everybody always says that. Let, let me just go over quickly. Um, Sonic box office okay so <clears throat> sonic the hedgehog the first movie made 319 million dollars at the box office all right so there was that uh let me see what the second one made <clears throat> and that was really good man that was really really good sonic the hedgehog 2 did better at 405 but so the box office went up about you know, less than a hundred million dollars and went up about 80 million bucks, right? 80, $85 million. I don't see any reason to believe in the world. And those two movies were really good. I don't see any reason to believe in the world that they went from 300 to 400 to a billion, right? I, I don't think there's any reason. There's no logical reason to believe that it's going to go from 400 million to a billion, so <clears throat> I can see it going up. I can see the box office going up from uh, Sonic 2, which made 405 million to maybe 500 million. I can see that happening if the movie's great and the great it get it gets great reviews and all that kind of stuff. Um, then yeah, 500 million may be possible, but a billion is an absolute pipe dream. Like if Sonic 1 had gone from 300 million to 750 million in the second one, then maybe you might be able to think about the third one being a billion with with see, but the first one only went up about eighty million bucks from the first one to the second one, so I think five hundred million is within reach, maybe even a little bit more than that. But a billion is a complete pipe dream. It's that, that that's not going to happen. All right, <clears throat> next up, we've got uh, X Eight writes. Marvel keeps on making stuff that doesn't fix the issue of who the leader of the Avengers is or who even the Avengers are, like the recent show Echo. Yeah, but none of that's really relevant. I, I mean, look, would we like to know the answer to that? Sure, but is that like, is that the problem of the MCU right now that we don't know who the leader of the Avengers is? None of that is the issue. The issue is they're not making high quality content. If they make high quality content, none of this would matter. So <coughs> even though that is true, I agree with you. They're not really addressing the issue of who's the leader of the Avengers, who's even on the Avengers team right now. You're right, they're not. It'd be kind of nice if they were, but even if they were, that stuff's not fixing the problems. Like, you can still have the same crappy Ant-Man movie, and at the end, Ant-Man go, boy, I just got an email that Doctor Strange is now the leader of the Avengers. Would that have made Ant-Man and the Wasp any better? No. So it's true they're not doing it, and it'll be nice if they would start doing that, but doing that, not them not doing that isn't the problem. And if they, even if they do, and when they do start doing that, that doesn't fix the problem. They got to make quality content. That's got to be their top priority right now. Uh, Dat Boy 2022, I uh, just sent in a super chat badge to be supportive. Thank you, Dat Boy. I appreciate that very much. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Christopher Brickner says, 
I'm surprised the Witcher or the the Wicked trailer didn't say part one. You know what? I think you're going to see movies move more and more away from that. People don't want to feel that they're going to part of a movie. You know, I never thought this before, but somebody made an argument to me and it, it, it changed my mind a little bit that I think what, did you notice that mission impossible dead reckoning part one, they've now removed the part one from the name of the movie. And I don't think the next movie is going to be called dead reckoning part two. I think they're going to call it mission impossible something, something. <clears throat> I think it is a bad marketing move to call something part one. Because it, 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 you're making an implied message to the audience that you're not about to see a complete movie, right? When you went to go see Star Wars, you saw a complete movie. It had an open door for a sequel, but it was a complete movie. Empire Strikes Back is a complete movie. Sure, they ended where, okay, we're going to go off and see if we can rescue Han and all that kind of stuff. But all the storylines in there got wrapped up. They told a complete movie with a beginning, middle, and end. Boom, there you go. You got an audience wants to at least feel that that's what they're getting when they're going to a movie. They want to feel that they're getting a complete movie. And so, and I think, you know, Fast and the, you know, Sir Malsum is making a very good point. Fast and the Furious 10 part one, right? Like it's, I think we're going to see movies move away from, from using those titling things. So I'm not surprised that they didn't do that. I mean, is it, is it the night and day difference, make or break difference? no. But does it have an impact on an average movie going audience member who's trying to make a decision about whether or not to spend their money to go see that movie or a different movie? I think I think a little bit. I think it has a little bit of an effect. Um, all right. Next up, Christopher Brickner writes, I wouldn't call Brady the goat yet as Mahomes is still playing. I want to wait until Mahomes is done to a career to comparison like total Super Bowl wins. Oh, no, 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 no. There is the he Brady is the goat. There's no doubt about it. Now, <laughs> who is the goat today can be replaced later down the road. That's the thing about goats, right? It's, it's as of right now, the greatest of all time is Tom Brady. At least that's what all the NFL players say. All the NFL players, all the NFL coaches, all the NFL pundits. Tom Brady is the greatest of all time. That is the general consensus. You can be one of these Tom Brady sucks people, and that's fine. But you have to acknowledge the general consensus is Tom Brady, the dude with seven rings on his hands and like most of the records and all that kind of stuff, a proven winner wherever he goes, he's the GOAT. Now, someday, somebody will surpass him. Someday. It'll happen eventually. And then maybe that next person becomes the GOAT. But there's always somebody who is currently the GOAT whether it's in basketball, movies, track and field, whatever. <clears throat> you don't say, you can't call anybody the GOAT because somebody might surpass him. Listen, Patrick Mahomes' career right now has been insane, but he has less than half the Super Bowl rings that Tom Brady has. Once Mahomes gets to five Super Bowl rings, then we can start ta having the conversation about will he surpass Tom Brady? And maybe he gets there, but right now, there is the GOAT, and that's Tom Brady. Somebody may surpass him. Daniel Day-Lewis is the GOAT of actors, and someday somebody may pass him. But that doesn't change the fact that as of right now, the greatest of all time is Tom Brady. All right, <clears throat> next up. Uh, Suthius writes, this year we see the return of Poe and Gru. Yep. Uh, Kung Fu Panda, I think, is the better trilogy, but Despicable Me trilogy has made so much more. Who takes it this year with box office? Despicable Me. Uh, Despicable Me 4 will make more money than Kung Fu Panda 4. It's just, <coughs> pardon me, it's more current. Uh, they've had a more consistent product coming out. It's currently higher up in the pop cultural consciousness. The minions are insanely popular. The movies make billions. Um, Kung Fu Panda might end up being the better movie, but Despicable Me will be the one that makes the more, more money. Uh, again, I don't know which one will be better, but I think it's pretty a pretty easy guess to say that despicable me for uh will be the one to make the most money all right and the final question today because i turned off super chats during the last uh, uh commercial break elvis c writes 
Can we take a moment to appreciate the fact that a high-class actor like Matthew McFadden is in Deadpool? Of course, we all saw him, the actor from Succession, just won an Emmy, uh, by the way, for the show. I think that was his first Emmy that he won. I think I loved seeing him in this trailer. As Rob would often say, he classes up the joint. And I love when he's sitting there and goes, walk with me. I, I thought that that was just great. I think he's going to be a really, really nice addition to this. I think he's going to fit in perfectly well to this. And I was actually personally very, very excited uh, to see him in there. <clears throat> All right, guys. And that'll do it for today's, we've gone well over two hours, a uh, long edition of Open Mic. Thank you so much for being here, making this little show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in those questions. Number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about. And number two, you supported our channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the show, thank you guys so very much for your support. And guys, thank you so much, all of you who are here, just for those of you particular who are watching live. Thank you guys for being here and just hanging out with me this afternoon. It's always good to do that. Um, yeah, so <laughs> make sure you come back and join us tomorrow. Obviously, we've got some things that we need to discuss. Uh, I mean, there's the Christopher Nolan thing. A whole bunch of other things have already started to put, we're putting together for tomorrow's show. Hopefully, you'll come and join us for that. We'll look forward to seeing you there. And of course, we'll do another open mic tomorrow. So if you want to send in a question for tomorrow's open mic, go ahead and you can start doing it now at our tip link at streamelements.com slash John Capers slash tip, or just wait until we're live and, and fire them in at that point. So guys, that'll do it for me for now. Thank you so much for being here. I'll see you all tomorrow. My name's John Campia. And until then, my friends, bye-bye.